you want me to handicap the race right now and tell you sure. who will win and save yeah. us a lot Let's of pointless arguing? It's got to be Andrew Shear. Uh, I think he's going to emerge as the winner, perhaps in a close showdown with Maxime Bernier. <laughs> well, when you are right, you are right. Not only did eminent Sunday scrummer Susan Riley pick last night's conservative leadership winner, she called how it would all go down. We'll never question her again, right, John? <laughs> Susan is going to be intolerable. Um, but nonetheless, she has to be given full credit for having uh, achieved something uh, that none of us, especially me, did, and that is picking Shear as the winner. All right, joining me today here in Toronto, freelance columnist, soothsayer, Susan Riley. Hi, Carol. John Ibbotson of the Globe and Mail. Hi, John. Hi. And holding the fort in Ottawa today for us, Denise Cialet from SEM Group Public Affairs. Good morning, Denise. Good morning, Carol. Wow, Susan, you called this. A, a lucky guess. I have to say it was a lucky guess, but... Uh, no, you uh, had your reasons. I had my reasons, yeah, and um, but I, I lost faith. You may recall that I did lose faith as the uh, campaign unfolded because uh, Andrew Scheer was so unexpectedly nervous, uh, in, especially in the early going. He seemed very tentative, and he, he would sort of vanish on the floor of those debates. Um, also, I didn't think his French uh, was as strong as I had expected it uh, to be since he'd been the speaker uh, in the Commons for so long. Um, nonetheless, uh, he he fit a lot. I ticked a lot of other boxes. Friendly to the social conservatives without being too strident on that issue. Um, you know, just kind of heartland. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that as, as we continue on, but let's wallow in the drama of last night for a moment, <laughs> right? As we watched one by one, each of the 13 candidates drop off the ballot and Maxime Bernier's lead shrink. John, what's your take on what happened last night? Well, it was a little bit like the 2006 Liberal Convention. If you remember back then, Michael Ignatieff uh, came out very strong in the first ballot and then just sat there as one candidate after another dropped off and moved to anyone but Michael Ignatieff and ultimately Stefan Dion um, came up to win it. In this case, uh, Mr. Bernier had, I believe, 29% of the vote in the first ballot. He was reasonably well ahead of Mr. Scheer, but then as one candidate after another, after another, after another, after another, after another, after another uh, dropped off, uh, it was clear that the second choices were going to other, were going to Mr. Shear and not to Mr. Bernier. Again, it was it was very very close. Just a few votes oh. either way uh, could have shifted it, um, or a few points in the riding system could have shifted it. And the room, I mean, I was in that it was I was in that room for two days, and even people who weren't supporting Maxime Bernier expected Maxime Bernier to win. Um, although, to give full credit, Shears people said, you wait, it's closer than you guys think it is. Um, so it, 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 just, it just was a case that if you believed in Maxime Bernier, you believed in him. And if you didn't, you absolutely and emphatically didn't. Denise, who brought Andrew Shear over the edge, in your opinion? It had to have been uh, Brad Trost. And in fact, looking at uh, the results that he hung on for so long was very interesting. So certainly when we saw him drop off that those votes, the social conservative votes, uh, went to went to went to Shear. And then of course, uh, given once Aaron O'Toole was no longer on, on the ballot, it seemed obvious that, that folks would then shift to uh, uh, Andrew Shear. And that was what was most interesting, where uh, the social conservatives, the fiscal conservatives, and in fact, I would say some of the libertarians um, aligned uh, in, in in, in many ways uh, behind Andrew Scheer, and he came out uh, with, uh, with the win, a palatable candidate for the Conservatives. Let's listen to what Brad Trost had to say about his fourth place finish last night. They have a voice, um, because Pierre and me represented the unwavering social Conservatives who, frankly, people were told could never win, so don't waste your vote on them. If you, if you want a winner, vote for someone else in the leadership race. You even saw that among MPs who are very, very strong social conservatives. A couple of them backed Maxine, many of them backed Andrew, some of them backed Aaron. But um, they have a voice. They're part of the party. I remember, social conservatives are also fiscal conservatives. They also care about national security. But they want their issues as one of many issues in the party. And I think that's the message. That's what the grassroots believes in in this party. And we need to uh, go forward with that uh, into the uh, parliament into the next election. Okay, let's see how much influence they're going to have uh, leading up to the next election. Susan, what do you think? Um, I don't think they're going to have any more influence, frankly, than they did under Stephen Harper. Um, 
I think, if anything, Andrew Scheer is probably more socially conservative than Stephen Harper was, although he was also he also uh, had elements of that in his uh, personality and ideology. Um, but I think there's an awareness, um, and Scheer has expressed it obliquely, uh, that it. So that that a lot of the country has moved on, especially on issues like gay marriage, um, and uh, the abortion is a perpetually divisive and difficult and heated issue. And most uh, party leaders of all the parties just avoid it like it's you know like it's uh, nuclear like it's nuclear mm -hmm. waste like or the something. Flag as they go. Yep. Yeah, John. Exactly. What, do you, what do you think? Yeah, so there were some people who were saying, well, this just shows that the Conservative Party is captive to the social conservatives. And that's not true. Uh, at the end, on the when it was down to four candidates, Mr. Trost had 15% of the vote. So in a broad governing coalition type party, you're going to have different elements. About 15% of the Conservative base um, is socially conservative. Uh, but, but one thing, uh, Andrew Scheer does have some socially conservative elements in his platform. He wants to give tax breaks, for example, to people who send children uh, to private schools or, or for homeschooling. And most important, you may remember that in the majority years of the Harper government, when the government was trying to shut down its own backbenchers from raising right-to-life issues in member statements, mm -hmm. it was Andrew Scheer, a speaker, who slapped down the government and said, I will recognize who I wish to recognize, and I'm going to recognize some of these backbenchers and let them have their say on the floor of the House of Commons. I think people People remembered that when they were casting a ballot. Okay, so but but at the end of the day, I mean, those private members' bills are all important to the social conservative group, and they they don't have another party to go to in this country. It is only the conservatives for them. So aren't they right to say we need to have some influence here going forward? There's a difference. I, that is sir. that is the the the, the fine line that Andrew Scheer has to walk now as leader as, uh, as leader of the conservative. Party, because quite frankly, um, Canadians are not willing to reopen those conversations around uh, same-sex marriage and um, abortion. Now, he has, uh, and I would actually compare it to um, the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party in Ontario, Patrick Brown, who ran and who was propelled into power uh, largely by social conservatives. And then, uh, as, as, as many of the social conservatives would view, he turned their backs on the, their values and their platforms. For Andrew Scheer, my sense is that his social conservatives, conservativeness lies in three core pieces family values, a Christian work ethic, and the free speech component. And he has to walk that very fine line where he continues to open up the, the conservative tent to those that were lost in 2015, but certainly to make sure that that party base, who are almost always more motivated than others to get out to the polls when they can support a candidate, continue to support uh, him as, as leader and come out in, uh, in strong numbers in 2019. I just want to say one thing very quickly, though. Um, the social conservatives are staying inside the Conservative Party. The progressive mm -hmm. conservatives, those maybe who supported Michael Chong, uh, they are staying inside the Conservative Party. We have seen conservative conventions that ended in bitterness and disarray and schisms. We have seen the party split into different components, as it did during the reform and progressive conservative years. I've never seen, I've said it before, I've, going into the convention, I had never seen the Conservative Party more united in defeat. Going out of the convention, I've never seen the Conservative Party more united under, uh, under its new leader. And that would have been the case with Mr. Bernier, too. The party is actually in very good shape. The coalition, at least the base of the coalition, is holding together. Okay, I'm going to talk about Michael Chong in a second, but I do want to introduce this. At the very last moment last night, we overheard Peter McKay say this, that the farmers actually put uh, Andrew Scheer over the top because they were certainly, the people in, in uh, uh, the third place finishers, uh, Aaron O'Toole's uh, camp, were not going to ever support Maxine Bernier because of his position on supply management. That's right. Uh, I think two things doomed Bernier. One, the supply management uh, issue, and the other, the fact that he is a francophone. And even though I'm not suggesting that there was, you know, hostility or, or anti-French feeling, um, I, I think there was, um, especially in the western part of the, the, uh, the country, a certain... There was, they were uncomfortable a little bit with handing uh, the power to another Quebec leader. Even though he didn't have a, as much power uh, supporting Quebec as you might have thought. True, and even though he had a lot of support in Alberta, but I, I, you can hear muttering, and, and you, you, you got the sense that uh, 
yeah, that it wasn't, uh, I wouldn't go as far as to say it was anti-French, but I just think there was a hesitation to give another Quebec leader uh, that, that uh, stage. Okay, so picking, picking up ahead. on that, it's less anti-French and more Quebec weariness. So we've had mm. Brian Mulrooney from Quebec, Jean Chrétien from Quebec, Paul Martin from Quebec, then we had a break with Stephen Harper, and then we keep coming, and then now Justin, Justin Trudeau. Trudeau from Quebec. So uh, uh -oh. we, we, I think there was a bit of a Quebec weariness there. Uh, but again, you know, with those 78 uh, uh, seats continues to be a game changer in, in uh, the federal map. Yeah, but I, I just don't buy that. I do think the issue of his of his of Mr. Bernier's English was an issue. He, he didn't speak well, especially in the speech on Friday night. People were worried about how well he would communicate in English Canada. But look, he did yes. get almost 50 percent of the vote. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what we have to say is one very quickly, though, Braxy Bernier lost because he stuck to his guns. We talk about politicians who live by polls and focus groups and cave to this pressure, that pressure. This is a guy who opposed supply management in Quebec. This is a guy who opposed subsidies to Bombardier in Quebec. And he was going to stand by it and he was not going to compromise. And I say, yeah, give, that, give him credit for that. Yeah, but John, a couple of days before the uh, b before this weekend, he said that if the party wasn't going to endorse supply management, he wasn't going to push it. And, and I thought, wow, uh, that that was a major concession on his part and it would have very much dismayed the people who liked his ideological purity. So I don't, I'm not sure he was, it was just, it just came too late, I think. Yeah. Well, okay. Maxime Bernier did not lose because he caved. Maxime Bernier lost because he stuck to his guns. Yeah, I agree.